For more on the mass uprising engulfing the U.S. and what protesters are demanding now, we go to Los Angeles, where we're joined by Robin Kelly, professor of African American studies at UCLA. He studies social movements, author of many books, including Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination. Professor Kelly, it's great to have you back with us, especially now. I mean, just in the last hours, you have the um, the icons of the Confederacy being tumbled throughout the United States. You have President Trump announcing he's giving his first campaign speech in months in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, the site of one of the worst massacres of black people in U.S. history um, on Juneteenth, June 19th. This in the midst of this global uprising. Talk about this moment we are in. Right. Yeah, that's a slap in the face. Um, let me begin by uh, talking about um, Felonis Floyd's testimony because um, it was, you know, listening to it again is very emotional. I mean, it really captures the moment we're in. Uh, it, it moved me in part because we've been hearing this speech, oh, I've been hearing this speech my entire life. Uh, I don't remember uh, a moment in my life when I hadn't heard someone talking about holding the police accountable, teaching cops to treat people with empathy and respect, uh, teaching them, you know, appropriate force. Uh, and I was really struck, again, this kind of captures the moment by how George Floyd, um, you know, called the, the officers, sir, and this is something that his brother mentioned, as he was being killed, called them, sir. Uh, and it was a painful and telling revelation, given given how you know black men and women were beaten or even killed for not addressing an officer of the law or any white man as sir. You know this has ha this happened to my uh, to my father-in-law. So in some ways, that question and the other question, which is what is a black man's worth? You know, twenty dollars. Um, this moment that we're in now raises that question. You have mass protests around the world uh, coming back to a perennial question is what are black lives worth? Um, are black lives worth more than uh, or less than property? I mean, Black Lives Matter drilled down on this question from the moment's inception, you know, asking the question, what kind of society is this that values property over black life? Um, and you know, when you think about even your last guest talking about, you know, tear gassing, um, the fact that people are being tear gassed during a pandemic, you know, and over this question of whether or not uh, black life has value. You know, so this is a really crucial moment. Um, clearly, Trump and his ilk are uh, really drilling down on what I would argue is, you know, a, a fascist response. Um, it's it's drilling down on a state that has no issue uh, taking people's lives over the smallest infraction. Uh, and I think, you know, I have a lot of, I, I, I shouldn't say hope, but I do have, I do imagine uh, real change occurring when you have uh, millions of people in the street saying, not what people said in 68, this is a very different moment. Uh, but actually saying that we can't have police as we knew it. You know, um, you think about the, the uprisings in the 1960s, where so many of these struggles emerging out of, you know, ghetto uh, communities, uh, you know, demanding an end to police brutality, police violence, demanding an end to the denial of basic needs, services, jobs. And in those days, the demand... The response to the demands were things like diversity, inclusion, um, community oversight, more black cops, uh, demands that officers live in the community. Um, you know, and you compare that to defunding the police, to basically reorganizing the way we deal with public safety. Uh, and this is coming from many different circles, people who, who thought five, six years ago uh, that was a ridiculous demand are now seeing it as not only viable, but we're seeing it happening. Um, we're seeing at least the beginnings of it happening. We'll see what how it turns out, you know. Well, Professor Kelly, I want to go back to something that you wrote uh, immediately following uh, 
uh, Trump's election in November 2016, you wrote that the U.S. needs a multiracial movement committed to, quote, dismantling the oppressive regimes of racism, heteropatriarchy, empire, and class exploitation that is at the root of inequality, precarity, materialism, and violence in many forms. You've just talked about how the demands of this movement are very different. Do you see what's happening now as what you wanted to happen in November 2016? Exactly. And not only that, but what I wrote in, in 2016 was actually a reflection of what was already happening on the ground. So in some respects, remember the Movement for Black Lives put out their, their policy platform in August of 2016. Uh, and one of the things I really, we all have to acknowledge is that we're not here by accident. You know, this is not a spontaneous response to the pandemic and suddenly uh, white people are, are waking up and saying, oh, wait a second, Black Lives Matter. No, this is a product of enormous work uh, going back well before, you know, Trayvon Martin. But, you know, but you think about, you know, all the organizing work, the, the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, uh, the women who organize Black Lives Matter, um, initiated Opal Tometi, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors, uh, people like Melina Abdullah, Charlene Carruthers of Black Youth uh, Project 100, uh, all the scholar activists who've been working on this question, Barbara Ransby, Kimberly Crenshaw, Angela Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. Um, and then before that, the Malcolm X grassroots movement, uh, Cop Watch, uh, Dignity and Power, Critical Resistance, the African American Policy Forum. These were uh, uh, initiatives on the ground who did all this political education, all this organizing work, um, recharge genocide, dream defenders, the rising majority, black organizing for leadership and dignity, and also groups like Surge, you know, standing up for racial justice, um, which deals with, you know, uh, white racism. So you have an infrastructure in place that that has been doing this work for a decade or more, more than a decade. And that's why people are out here. That's why people can come onto the streets and simply roll off their tongue words like defund the police, um, connect um, transphobia, homophobia, um, uh, uh, gender oppression, patriarchy to uh, racial capitalism and to racial violence, connect these things in ways that I think are kind of unprecedented. But again, without the organizing work, we would not be here, you know? And I think it's very important to even go back and acknowledge how the foundations were laid by the Combahee River Collective, you know, by people like Barbara Smith, um, raised by the Third World Women's Alliance. I mean, fighting around questions of c connecting sterilization, uh, abortion rights uh, with, you know, racism. You know, so these kinds of links, these connections, and also with war uh, are important. So there's a long history that, that got us here. And, and what the real question now is whether or not this can be sustained, because we know throughout history, we've had revolutionary moments after Reconstruction in the 1870s, followed by backlash and by what we could describe as American fascism. We have... Um, the, the sort of second reconstruction of the 1960s, followed by backlash, the rise of the Klan, the tamping down on the strike wave in the 1970s, um, uh, the neoliberalism. And now we're facing another one. You have these forces trying to transform the world in a way that could actually bring safety and prosperity to all versus a president and a regime that asks you know, what happened to Gone with the Wind? Well, Professor Kelly, you, you talked about the long history of this movement, which certainly is the case. Uh, it builds on many precursors of this kind of uh, rebellion. But it also has their dimensions of a dark side in some of the phrases that are being employed, especially in the media here, some of the media, uh, and that is looting, Looting is, in fact, loot is a Hindi word with Sanskritic origins, and it entered the language in colonial India. 
uh, with South Asian historian Vazira Zamindar pointing out that its initial usage, one of its initial usages, was to define as rapists and looters those who were involved in the first rebellion against the East India Company in 1857. Uh, and I mean, it's very difficult to imagine, and they were characterized as looters and rapists. It's very difficult to imagine that Trump would know this history, uh, but he certainly knows of its connotations. So could you talk about the use of the term looting in, in the media and the fact that you've said every single rebellion and uprising has included it? Right. Well, you know, the other day I did a... Um a Google News search, you know, sort of search engine, and put in looting, and I got one, I got 19 million hits, and then I put in excessive force, and got 1.1 million hits. So what's interesting is the way that the media really has uh, grabbed on to looting as the problem. It, dis it displaces some of the major issues that are being raised, especially the the violence of the police against protesters. And so what's interesting about looting. You know, if you look at the long history, there is not a uh, civil disturbance, civil unrest of, of any significance, or even a natural disaster, in which some sort of, you know, flash looting or appropriation of, of goods uh, didn't take place. Um, so that's, that's not uncommon. Also, there's a tendency to treat looting as a way to, to, um, uh, to dismiss legitimate organizing work, when, in fact, many people who are sort of seizing the moment, uh, in, the, in, in this case, during an economic crisis with 40 million people applying for unemployment, as if somehow those kinds of attacks on property or appropriating property are themselves part of a movement, a part of a wing of a movement. And we know that's not the case at all. Um, what the question of looting does bring to fore are two things. One, um, what it goes back to, to, um, to Mr. Floyd's question, what is a black man's life worth? What is a black person's life worth? Um, is the destruction of property or taking things or taking sneakers or computers um, somehow more important than watching someone die on film? You know, watching the thousand, 5,000 some odd people killed by the police over the last few years. I mean, what's more important? And so what's the value of someone? The second uh, part of looting is it displaces the looting that is the history of the United States. We know that, um, that human bodies, you know, were, that black bodies were looted. That's how we got here. That indigenous land was, was looting, uh, seizing that land. Uh, we know that uh, for for years, um, the housing market has been a kind of form of looting in which value of, of black-owned homes have been suppressed, black wages suppressed. The transfer of wealth um, is a kind of form of looting. But also, if you look at the history of race riots in, in America, most so-called race riots were basic pogroms, going back to Cincinnati in 1839, 1841, going back to a uh, whole way, range of, of so-called race riots in Philadelphia. You mentioned Tulsa uh, in the opening of the show, Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was a kind of looting, not a kind of looting, but you're talking about uh, destroying 35, squ square, uh, 35 blocks of, of uh, black-owned property and businesses um, worth millions of dollars. Um, people going into people's, white people going into homes with the support of the police, taking black people's stuff, destroying and taking stuff. Um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, East St. Louis in 1917. We could talk about Rosewood in 1923. Uh, you know, there's so many examples. Springfield, Illinois, 1908. Um, and some of that looting is also about taking political power. And so one last example I want to give is the most absurd and that is, if you notice, um, uh, during uh, George Floyd's funeral, the New York Stock Exchange uh, decided that it would go silent and not trade um, for uh, eight minutes and 46 seconds. 
Now, what's interesting about that is that talk about looting. Wall Street has profited from police misconduct. I mean, to consider that cities have been paying out billions to cover police misconduct uh, lawsuits. When they can't pay out the settlement, what do they do? Um, they, they try regular tax revenue. They can't afford it. They fleece the poor with more fees and fines, and they also borrow. And when cities and counties issue bonds to pay for the cost of police misconduct, which is in the billions of dollars, um, banks and other firms collect the fees for their services, investors earn interest, and then using the bonds to cover the settlement, those bonds end up costing um, sometimes as much as 100 percent more than the original settlement. So this is a transfer of well, wealth from over-police communities to Wall Street, which go to Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America. And this is what is called police brutality bonds. Robin, well, this is a great study with this. Yes. Robin, D.G. Kelly, we're going to have to leave it there, but we have okay, so great. much more to talk about with you, and we hope to have you back very soon. Uh, Robin sure. Kelly is professor of African-American studies at UCLA. He studies social movements, author of many books, including Freedom Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination. 30 seconds, and then we go to Seattle. 